I want to preach to you, continue on this subject of church government, sorry, uh, on this series of the church and this message part 9, I think it is part 8, but we have been dealing with what the church is, what it looks like, how it functions, how it operates. Here this morning, I want to preach to you, if I can, as briefly as I can, on church government. Reading with me from Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. In fact, I'm going to read to you. You go to Acts 20. I'll meet you there. I'm going to read one verse from 1 Corinthians 12, where we read and preached from last week. Church government. Listen to this verse in 1 Corinthians 12, then we'll go to Acts 20. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. And listen. And God has set some in the church. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, and listen this, governments, diversities of tongues. Then reading from Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. Acts 20 verse 17. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called, and notice this, the elders of the church. Then down to verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. To feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know that after my departing, the grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word and your truth. And my God, we do want true government, not the government of this world, but the government of heaven established in this church, a government that is righteous and pure and holy, a government that is according to the written scripture. Lord God, a government that will bring joy and peace and righteousness into the lives to the sheep in this church. Lord God, a government that's going to make this church to function in a right way. And Father, I do pray for your grace, your favour. Lord God, that you would speak to our hearts, that you revive us, that you stir us. Lord God, that you'd make us ready to function as the church of God in this city. And Lord God, I do want to lead this people. Lord God, I do want to feed them this morning and my God I do want to guard them by your grace and your mercy would you honour your word the preaching of your word in Jesus name yes. Amen Amen. <coughs> Amen I want to preach to you here on church government here this morning listen that again church government it's a biblical word and it's a biblical teaching I don't know whether you saw the news over the past 24 hours, but America's government has begun to shut down as of about 24 or more hours ago. Yesterday morning, we all woke up to the newspapers, to the news, and what was announced is the American government is shut down. It's in a condition of being shut down. And here I'm not preaching politics this morning. I'm giving you an example. I'm talking about government. America is one of the greatest financial nations in our world. It's one of the greatest military powers in the world. Yeah. It's got a very large population. And yet in one hour, because of a problem with that government... The entire nation is going to begin to shut down. Listen to what I'm saying to you this morning. Because this is what the Bible actually teaches. Yesterday in Congress, the federal government gathered together. Congress, with its two political parties, could not come to an agreement. Therefore, the entire government went into a state of shutdown. What happened yesterday morning was the start of a process. It's not a one-off act. It's a beginning of a process that starts mildly and becomes very, very serious. 
As of yesterday morning, federal workers will not get paid. Soldiers will not get paid. Firemen will not get paid. All those who are under government employment will not get paid. About 850,000 people. 41% of the government's workforce are literally not going to be working tomorrow morning. The government has shut down. As of yesterday morning, in America, you can't get a passport, you can't get a visa, you can't get a gun permit, you can't get a loan, you can't get a mortgage, you can't visit national parks or national museums. Everything is beginning to shut down. This has happened 12 times since 1981. It can last from one day to 21 days and it keeps getting worse every single day and affecting more and more of the entire nation. You see, without a government, the nation cannot function. Yeah. You see, as of yesterday morning, Joe Bloggs wakes up and he says, I'm fine, I've got money in my pocket, I can go to the shop, I turn on my television. Hey presto, what else do I need? I'm happy, I don't care about the government. I want to assure you, the shutting down of that government will affect you within the next days and the next weeks. It will affect every single area of your life and you and the entire nation will be brought to a crisis. Here this morning, I want to preach to you on the importance of church government. Listen again what I read in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. For God, notice it's God has set some in the church, not all, it's not for everybody, only some. Notice what he's saying, that God is actually himself, not man, not church organization, yeah. God himself in heaven has actually set deliberately in the church mm -hmm. some. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, gifts of healing, helps, and notice this, governments and diversities of tongues. God has put government within the church. He has actually put certain men, notice that, certain men who are called governments. They fulfill a ministry of governments. Everybody does them in the church. There's gotta be some helps. You can't be helps in the church and governments at the same time. Yeah. Someone has to be government. Notice it's different than being an apostle or prophet or a teacher. There are, there is a function and certain men that God puts in the church, they become the government of that church. It's not everybody. It's not a democracy. We're not voting. There are certain individual men who God says, they are my government in that church. They represent me. They speak for me. They act on my behalf. And if they listen to me, they will actually guide you. All right, listen to what it says in Acts 20, if you still have it open there. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 17, this is Paul who actually comes back to the island of Miletus and he calls for the elders at Ephesus. Notice there was more than one from the city of Ephesus, a city slightly bigger than Limerick. And he called for all of the elders, come and meet me. Notice he didn't call all the church. Notice he had a message for the elders. He didn't say, well, we don't want anyone left out. He said, the elders, I need to speak to the elders. And you know what? I can't go to Ephesus again. You come over and meet me and I have a message for you. So it says in verse 17 that he called the elders of the church. Notice that elders are in the church. Mm -hmm. Elders of the church. They're in the church. They're part of the church at Ephesus, not of any other city or town. They're elders in the church at Ephesus. Who are these elders? Let's look a bit further. This word elders is the Greek word presbyteros, where we get our word presbytery or presbyterian from. The word actually means elderly. Okay, I don't have any white hairs, but older are the most senior, are the most mature. So these elders are the most mature members, men in that church at Ephesus. 
God has put governments within his church. And notice here, these elders are the mature ones. And all through the Bible we read about the elders. It's not maturity of age. It's maturity of spirituality. We're not talking about our city or society. We're talking about the church. And there's certain men who are called elders because of their seniority yeah. or their maturity or their experience of life and church life. Yeah. Just follow with me and it's Paul speaking here. Down to verse 28. And Paul's speaking to these elders. And he says, take heed therefore unto yourselves. Who's he speaking to? The elders. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. That's the sheep, the church. Over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Do you know that word overseers, the Greek word, is episcopus. It's where we get the word bishop from. Every time you read bishop in the Bible, it's episcopus. It means a person who oversees. Notice here the title elder and bishop is not church titles. A bishop is not a man with a funny hat on who oversees a region or an area. What does the word bishop mean? It means a superintendent, somebody who looks over the church, one local church in Ephesus. He said, you elders, listen to this, you elders, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Everybody doesn't do that. Everybody is not mature in the church. And that would be impossible. I hope we're never all mature. You know why? I hope new people are coming in and getting saved. I hope we have baby Christians in here. Amen. You know a sign of life is the babies you hear crying this morning. Yeah. As we come around the Lord table. I love it. Yeah. And, and I hope we always have the same in this church. That we have spiritual babes as well. Yeah. And, and maybe crying out in the midst of everything. And maybe the dirty their nappies. That's just fine. Isn't that what babies do? Yeah. But I'm telling you, we're not all mature, but there are those who are called elders put in the church of God. And just because you're older, you've been around here 30 years, doesn't make you an elder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, I've seen lots of people in church 30 years, they have no maturity whatsoever. They have no spiritual depth. But these same men are called bishops. They oversee the work of God. Then in Titus chapter 1, it's a, Paul speaking to Titus. And Titus is in the island of Crete. Yeah. Paul sent him there to minister to the churches. Who's Titus? He's an apostle. He's a preacher. And Paul actually writes a letter to him. And he says, for this cause left I in thee in Crete. That thou shouldest set in order that things are wanting or that are lacking. In other words, in the churches there was something missing from the churches. They were churches. They're born again. They love Jesus. They're evangelizing. They're loving one another. It's real. Jesus is in the midst. But he said there's something missing. And you know, Titus, I want you to go through those churches. And I want you to put in place what is missing. Because it's lacking, it's not finished, it's not right until this is in place. What was it? He said, listen, and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. So he was saying, Titus, Titus, I want you to go into that city and find the church that I raised up. And I didn't appoint leaders. How could I? They're only born again. They're only getting saved. It's the beginning of a new church. But I want you to go back there now. And I want you to find the elders and the bishops. In other words, men who actually are mature. They may only have been saved two years. They may only have been saved a short time. They may only be 25 or 30 years old. But I'm telling you, they are the mature men of God. And they're qualified. And the Holy Spirit is working on their lives. And you know what? In their heart, they're watching over the church. They have a desire. They're watching the lives in there. And they care for the church. And he says, when you find them, I want you to ordain them. Pray for them publicly. And say, these men are the elders in this church. I want you to find them and ordain them. And say, you know what? These men are going to look after you as a church. You need government in the church. 
Everybody is in government. Everybody does not lead. Be assured of that. We, we read of this word elders 200 times and more in the Bible. In the Old Testament, we read of elders all through the Old Testament. Elders are put over villages, over towns, over cities, and over entire nations. All through Exodus, we read about elders. In the, under the patriarchs, elders operated under their ministry. Under the time of the judges, elders were the spiritual ministry. Under the time of the kings, elders were in their place. Listen to what it says as we read the lives of Moses, there were elders. Under Joshua, there were elders. Under David, there were elders. Under Solomon, there were elders. Right down to the days of Ezra. Ezra made sure raise up elders to look after God's people. The prophets Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Joel preached to the elders of Israel. Those prophets said we need to speak to the elders first. If the elders are right, the entire People of God will be right. If the elders are wrong, the entire church is wrong. If the government has gone into shutdown, everybody's going to be affected in that church in a very real way. When Moses appointed elders, listen to what he said in Exodus 18. And this is God speaking to Moses. How do you find elders? Thou shalt provide out of all of the people, listen to this, able men. Such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness or hating money. And place such over them, over the people of God. If you can find such, to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds and rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. In other words, elders could look after ten people or they might look after a thousand people. One elder may have the responsibility for ten souls. And God says, this is what I want amongst my people. Men of truth, men of holiness, men of character, men of the word of God. And you know what? Make those men elders. If you can find that in a man, man, these are rare as hen's teeth. Do you know hens don't have teeth? Hope you do. Elders like this are as rare as hen's teeth. But when we come to the New Testament, we read this word elder. Are these mature leaders 19 times in the church? This is God's leadership in the local church. The apostles in Jerusalem raised up elders by Acts chapter 15. You see, at the beginning there were 12 apostles. There was great revival. And all, all through the history of that church, there's no elders there. But those 12 apostles, before they go out into all the nations and all the world to preach, they raise up elders who are going to stay in Jerusalem. And they're not going to go travel to the end of the earth. They're going to stay there in Jerusalem. They're local men. They're Jerusalem men. And they're in the church in Jerusalem. And they're going to function as elders in that church of Jerusalem. When we read in the book of Acts chapter 14 about Paul and Barnabas going on their first missionary journey. It says after they went through and seen many saved and many healed. And new churches arising for the first time ever in certain towns. Listen to what it actually says. It says then they returned to those churches in Lystra, Iconium and Antioch and when they had ordained them elders in every church notice this again like Paul said to Titus to do it here again we have Paul and Barnabas going back through the church and saying can I find such men saints can I ask you can I find such men in this church in Limerick City Church can I find such men are we going to raise up such men to lead this church not just one gifted man but to raise up elders, bishops, to care for the flock of God. Because you know what the Bible tells me? The Holy Spirit makes you such. Amen. 
and it is God himself raises up such lies and he puts governments in the church and this church needs governments. It needs gifted men who have governmental gifting. God has enabled them to lead the flock of God. We do need it in this church in, in, in a very real way. Government never rests with one man or you can get tyranny. But God raises up gifted men yeah. to labor together in, in, in the church of God. Paul's speaking to Titus again. He says, for this cause I left thee in Crete, that you can put elders in every city. This is a vital task. Elders, bishops, overseers, presbyters. There's three things I just want to leave you with this morning that are vital concerning church government. God's government that he puts in the church. What does it look like? How does it function? How do you recognize it? If God is setting you in this church as a part of government or to be an elder or a bishop, what is your task? How, how are you to operate as an elder or as a bishop? And I want to tell you, I am an elder here this morning. And I am a bishop. Amen. But more than that, God has given me a gifted ministry in this church to come to this city. To raise up other men who are local men. Men of this city. Men who are going to stand. And you know what they're going to do? Three great tasks. And I'm prophesying because I tell you, out of the mess of this city, we are going to raise up a godly eldership in this church. I, I, I haven't said this before, but I'm saying it this morning. It's not going to all rest on my shoulders. We are going to raise up men of quality, chosen of God, men who walk in the light of God's scripture, to be the government, to be the eldership, to be the presbytery of this church. These are the three tasks. Number one, leading the flock. Number two, feeding the flock. Number three, guiding the flock. First of all, leading the flock. What is the task of an elder or a bishop? And notice bishops work with other bishops within one church. It's not a man with a funny hat. It's not St. Patrick. There were no such hats in St. Patrick's Day, I assure you. What is a bishop? He's a godly man who looks out for your soul. Mm. Number one, leading the flock. Leading the flock. One of the statements used regularly all through the Bible for these elders. It says, these men rule in the church. They rule in the church. It's all through the Bible. It means to stand before you, the people of God, or to preside over you, or to maintain, maintain the rule in the church, or to be over you in Jesus Christ, or to attend to you and watch out for you and to help you and look over your soul. That's what true leadership is. Leadership isn't given orders. Leadership isn't just to say, I have a position and title. A leader is much more than that. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, 17, it talks about the elders who rule well. What do elders do? They rule. An elder rules. Not everyone. Only the elders rule. They stand in front of everyone else. They, ha they have to keep the order in the entire church. That is their task. That is their call in everything. Yeah. They are actually to watch over everybody. The entire church, they are to watch over it in a very real way. It says in Hebrews 13, 7, <coughs> that they rule over you. Who rules over you? Nobody's going to rule over me. Man, you better throw your Bible out. Amen. Or maybe you should read your Bible and yes. believe it. The same Christ who saves you and loves you. Do you know what he says in the Old Testament? I so love you that I'm actually going to give you shepherds after mine own heart to look after you. You're sheep, but I will give you shepherds. If you don't have someone looking after you, why not? If there isn't someone in this church who cares for your soul, watches out for how you live, watches over you lest you be tempted or deceived, why not? This is the task of eldership in the church. They rule over you. They also rule by persuasion. They rule by example. They rule in diligence. They rule well. The scripture says all of these things. 
Now going back to 1 Corinthians 12, 28, the word governments, the governments in the church, the Greek word, do you know what it means? It means to steer. Do you hear me? I'm talking about elders leading the church. The word government means to steer or, or, or to maneuver your way through an, an, an actual storm. It means to pilot a ship or to direct a ship. This word governments is used in the New Testament for a ship captain. And if you see a ship captain, remember Paul, he was shipwrecked three times. And do you know what? I've seen churches that have been shipwrecked. And I've seen Christians make shipwreck. Why? Because of the priest or the minister or the bishop or the apostle or the pastor. And do you know what? Because he wasn't a man of God, he led them in a wrong direction, into wrong teaching. He abused them rather than leading them. But notice this government. It means to actually be a man in the church who pilots the ship, who steers the ship. Do you know what happens? When you hit a storm, if you're on a boat, on a ship, going somewhere, and a great storm comes, and that ship is swaying, you better hope that you've got the right captain at the helm in that boat. You better have a captain who says, I know how to get us through. Since we're not all called to steer the ship, that would be radically impossible. Can you imagine an entire church and we hit a storm and here's the steering wheel. I want to go this way. No, I want to go this way. I think we should go here. I think we should go there. It's confusion. You will hit rocks. That is no government at all. What is government? A government is a man standing at the helm of that ship and say, I, I've got the care of all these people who sail in this boat. I care for them. You know what? I'll be the first to go down this boat. Get in the light boats. I'll go down with this ship. Isn't that what they used to do? In all the old movies, you'd see that captain, the boat's going to sink. Well, he's up there taking his last drink, last cigar, whatever, poor guy on his way to hell. But do you know what? He's got honour. He says, this ship's going to go down. Mm -hmm. I am going to die. You know why? I'm not leaving my ship. This ship may sink. I'll be here. Can I tell you something? I'll be the last man off this sinking ship. <laughs> all, all hell can come against us. When, when all the dust clears, I'm going to be standing here. Well, I'm still here. Yeah. I'm ready to preach. Let's have another prayer meeting. Let's go up. Someone go evangelize. Since I am here as a pilot Amen. to be on the steering wheel. I once read about an old fisherman, an old captain of the sea, and he had a terrible storm. And you know, in those old days, many boats got wrecked. And he was in the storm, and fear literally filled these men. These were old seasoned fishermen. These were men of the sea. They grew up like this, but they got scared. They're strong men, but they're scared. And they're saying, we're going to die. And this night is our ordained day to die. We, we, we're finished. This boat's going to get pulled apart. And that old captain, he looked at them, the fear, the concern, the despair, the discouragement, the hopelessness. And he says, I've got to do something. I said, guys, bring me a rope. And they brought him a large rope and they said, what do you want it for, Captain? He says, come with me, tie my hands onto this wheel. And they said, Captain, the ship's getting pulled apart. He said, I'm going to steer this boat through the storm. No matter what comes, I, I, you do it, tie my hands, and tomorrow morning you'll cut me free. And that man, he had his hands tied to that steering wheel. And you know what? When the, when the waves hit him, those ropes kept him there. Oh, give us preachers again in the church. Give us elders, presbyters, bishops who actually bind themselves to the pulpit in this hour and say, I'm not going to get discouraged. I'm not throwing away my hope. I'm not giving up in the backslider. I'm not giving up in the sinner. I'm not giving up in one of you. I'm staying here. And if you stay in this boat, I'll bring you through the storm. I'll preach you through. I'll encourage you through. I'll send you an email. I'll send you a text. I'll, I'll, I'll do something. But saints, I am going to pray you through. I'm going to preach you through. And Paul of old in the book of Acts, Remember that ship that he was traveling on and it was going to be destroyed. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him and everyone was scared. All the Roman soldiers, all, all these great rich men, all the prisoners. And they say, we're going to die. We're not going to make journeys in. We're not going to do it. We're going to die. 
and an angel of the Lord comes to Paul and said, Paul, I just want to tell you from the boss, from government above, I, I've got a message for you, Paul. Amen. Not one man, not one soul that travels in this boat of yours with you is going to be lost. Not one. Hallelujah. But here, you better tell him, don't you leave that boat. Do you remember the story? And Paul stood up in the midst of the crowd and they're crying. And they're wringing their hands. And they're pulling out their hair. And you know what he says? Behold, do not fear. The angel of the Lord appeared to me this night. And not one single soul is going to be lost. But he gave them the warning. Don't you leave this boat. Since I'm talking about eldership in the church, old-fashioned eldership that cares for that boat. You know, in the Old Testament, Joseph was called the governor of Egypt. Where did God find him? Well, he, he, he was in the prison. Mm -hmm. He was discouraged. He was saying, I'm forgotten about. Here I am with my long hair, my long beard, my ripped up clothes. I had dreams. I had words from the Lord. For years I served him. And here I am in a prison, hopeless distraught whatever happened that vision God gave you and in one single day God lifted him up out of that prison and made him second only to Pharaoh and Pharaoh said you are the governor over the entire nation of Egypt we are in a famine we are about to go into the worst famine seven years of famine in world history and you're the man to steer us through your God will give you wisdom to bring us through the storm you're the right man for the task you see that's what a, an elder a leader is since I have been here put by God Amen. and I've got no problem to say that Amen. I'm a weak man I'm a man with discouragements and faults and a broken heart I preach to you with a broken heart. My heart's broken last night. It's broken this morning. It's broken to you as I preach. But I've got a wonderful Savior I want to tell you about. Amen. And Jesus will bring you through every storm. Save you from every sin. Deliver you from every demon. He is so, so real. Secondly, feeding the flock. Not only leading the flock, but feeding the flock. It says in the qualifications for eldership or bishops. It says twice. Once in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Again in 2 Timothy chapter 2. It says that elders must be apt to teach. The word apt there means he must have the ability to teach. It doesn't mean he's got the gifted ministry, ministry of teaching. He doesn't. He doesn't have to. But he needs a basic ability to open up the word of God to show you how to get saved how to live holy how, how to walk with God what to do in basic situations a, 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 an elder or a bishop in the church is to feed the church to provide spiritual food so that you'll get convicted when you need convicted yeah. and you'll get encouraged when you need encouraged and you'll get instructed and enlightened when you need enlightened. That is the purpose of having elders in the church. It talks in 1 Timothy chapter 5, 17 about the elders who labor. That means to work hard all day long. They labor to the point of exhaustion. They labor until their eyes are tired. They, they labor on, on, until they are at the end of themselves. They give all their energy, all their thought, all their strength, all of their time to labor in the word and doctrine. Notice not all elders do that. Some elders do that. All elders have to teach, yeah. have to be able to teach. But certain elders actually labor, not all elders. But certain elders, they actually labor in the word of God and doctrine. Certain men in this church have to be set aside to go. Doctrine is my job. Do you hear me? Yeah. The, the, the teachings, the doctrines of the Bible. And you know what? That's what I do. I am called as an elder in this church. My job is to labor in doctrine. What the Bible teaches. In the word of God. This is my job. You want to come to work with me? I, I assure you. You spend 10 hours with me working like I do I'll drain every one of you your mind will be punch drunk I assure you you see there are certain elders called to this to labor to work you know all men are not called to be out there in the field 
Some men are scrawnier than others. Certain men have more of a build, more of a stamina and a strength. Man, I'm not, I'm, I, I, I'm not sending a weed of a man out to pick turnips or to do some heavy building work. You know, if I'm a man building a house and I look and here's all the guys who come to work, they're all scrawny little guys. You could knock them over if you blew on them. I'm going to say, man, I, I need some muscle here. Not everybody can do every job. And make them helps, make them, make, let them go type up the letters in the office. But I don't want them out here building. Saints, certain men are called to feed you. There's certain men are so confused in their mind they couldn't teach you anything. And yet they're the very ones who want to teach everyone. There was a man come to this show, the Lord, I love the Lord. He sat back there, he said, I love the preaching. I've never heard preaching like this in 30 years. This is great, I love this, this is my church. And then one day he got me in my living room, waited to Candace, went out of the room, and he said, now just one thing, when are we going to have a proper Bible study? I said, uh, I was shocked. <laughs> I, I said, now brother, we just had 15 messages on how to judge biblically. Now I in my entire life only ever heard one message. I've just preached 15 on a Wednesday night. Had you ever heard that? Oh no. Did, did, did you get taught in those? Oh yes. What do you mean a Bible? Teaching them. A Bible class. He said, oh well, you know where we all sit in a circle and we all give our ideas and we all open up our Bibles and we all give our opinions and in fact I just happen to have a full course I could teach. <laughs> do you know that man had only in 40 years read the Bible through once? And he wanted to come in here and teach me and teach you and teach us all in here. Saints, I'm telling you the condition of, of, of the church. In 1 Peter 5, Peter's speaking to the elders. And he said, I'm a fellow elder. I thought he was an apostle, yes. But he says in 1 Peter 5, he said, I am a fellow elder. When I'm in the church, I'm an elder. When I'm in that local city or town, I function as an elder. But you know what? When I go out and preach elsewhere. When I visit other churches, I'm no longer an elder. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ sent out to minister. Listen to what he says to the elders. Feed the flock of God which is among you. We need elders in this church who will feed the flock. Not with nice stories. Not with testimonies. Not with theological questions. Not with great mysteries. But to actually feed the flock. That is among you with the word of God. Paul writing here in Acts chapter 20 to the elders in Ephesus. He says for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Do you know what the word shunned means? Look at him. He's saying to the elders. I have not shunned to declare unto you elders and your churches. The full counsel of God. The word shunned means I have not hidden anything under the table. I haven't kept anything out of your sight. I haven't hidden anything that's secret. I've not been ashamed to preach about sin and repentance and about walking holy. I'm not ashamed that some people in today's church are. will say, shh, don't mention their idols. Yeah. Hold on, the Bible says if you yeah, use yeah, idols, yeah. you're on your way to hell. Yeah. Do you know the Bible says that? The Bible says if you pray to saints or to Mary or to anyone else apart from God the Father through Jesus, your prayer is in her. What did Jesus say teaching you to pray? He says, listen, I want to teach you to pray. When you pray, pray like this. Father which is in heaven. Jesus taught, why did we not pray like that? Many in our city say, I'm a Christian. I'm a Catholic. Why did they not pray like Jesus taught? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who changed it? When did it change? I could tell you. I could give you the dates. I could give you the times. But notice here that Paul was saying, you elders, I've declared everything unto you. I haven't hid anything. And he speaks unto them and he says, now hear me. God the Holy Ghost has made you overseers of the church. Preach the word of God unto them. Feed the flock. He says in Acts chapter 20, you elders, you bishops, you mature men, you that care about people, if you care about souls, preach the word, preach the cross, 
Preach the blood. Yeah. Preach what is written here. See, the Bible says, the Bible says, this is a commission to elders. Don't move away from the word of God. It's not about a dream or a vision or a miracle. Preach the word of God. Brother Clendenin flew in here to Shannon Airport some years ago. We went and picked him up. We're sitting at a burger place down the road here. And he's telling us about meetings in South America. 100,000 men and women in meetings every single night. Blind eyes were open. Deaf ears were open. I'm sitting there going, man. Brother Clinton rarely mentioned miracles, but seeing the miracles follow him. And we're sitting having our burgers down the road, and we're talking about this. And Brother White said, these are some of the most amazing meetings that I've been in with, with the man of God. Well, we got into the meetings, I'm going, man, tell everybody about the deaf ears. Tell everybody about blind eyes being open. Tell everybody about the hundred thousand that were there in every meeting. You know what he got up? He got up. He opened the word of God. He says, turn with me to the text. And he preached the word of God. Yeah, he didn't yeah. even mention the miracles. Didn't tell them about the deaf ears open. You know why? Your sheep, a miracle will never feed you. Yeah, yeah, it can be wonderful and amaze you. Yeah. But it will not feed your soul. The word of God, the Bible, yeah, will yeah. actually feed your soul. Yeah. That's why Paul says in 2 Timothy, preach the word. You preachers, Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. In other words, doesn't matter where it's winter or summer. Preach the word. In winter, when it's all cold, everything's dead. Nobody responds. Preach the word. In the summertime, when they're all coming, preach the word. Just keep preaching the word. Reprove. Oh, preachers to reprove. Rebuke. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Do you know the Bible says an elder has to hold fast to the word of God. T Titus 1 verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. If you're not taught, you can't teach anybody else. If you don't learn from the teacher up here, how will you teach anybody else? It's impossible. Paul actually says holding fast the faithful word as you were taught it. How do you learn in the church? How do you become an elder? How do you become a preacher of the word? You better learn what's being taught to you. Then you go on to teach. If you can do it better, God bless you. I'll sit and listen to you. I'll be glad to. I tell you, when my hoary head comes on me, there better be preachers in this church. I better be able to be wheeled in through that door or carried up the steps. I'm going to sit here. And there better be a preacher in this church that can stir my heart, put a smile on my face, convict my heart reveal to me the will of God since I'm telling you what's got to be in this church I do have a dream and it's of elders being in this church in this city who cannot be moved from their task it says having been taught that ye may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince all the nice believers doesn't say that to exhort and convince the gainsayer. In other words, elders, what's a gainsayer? It's someone who argues all the time. Someone who keeps contradicting you. Someone who refuses to listen to the preaching, the teaching, and the advice, and the wise counsel. You know, I've often said to people, I'd say, wisdom says. You know, they ask advice about a situation. And I'd say, if I was you, I would do this. What am I saying? I know the Bible. I know God's will. You don't need to do this, but if you're wise, you will listen to me. Because I've spent many years studying this book, and I'm not giving you an opinion, or a thought, or an idea, or my own intelligence. I'm giving you something that I know. I won't give you one bit of advice that's not from this book. But notice the elders know how to, how to deal with gainsayers, people who always argue. For there are many unruly, vain talkers, deceivers, whose mouths must be stopped. Do you know that's one of my jobs is to shut mouths? There's certain people going to come in from the outside. Oh, I know it all. I had a dream. I had a vision. Here, here's a verse you haven't seen before. Here's a special teaching. Hey, I know the preacher doesn't know this, but let me tell you, be very careful of backseat drivers. Who drives here? And Todd, do you like a backseat driver? Stop, go, turn left, watch out. 
I, I tell you, at an early stage of my, you ladies do it more than us guys. Us guys go quiet. You ladies go vocal if anything's going wrong. I'm, I'm talking when, at an early stage of our marriage, I said, do you know, Candace, women are prone to do this. I've been driving since 17 years old. I've been through an awful lot. And, and, and I know you're a better driver than me. But you know what? As soon as I'm driving and you say, watch, wait, go. I said, do you know what happens? You almost get us killed because I hesitate. I question. I know how to drive a car. I've been doing it a long time. Do you know I know how to lead a church? Amen. I not, know, not only know how to lead it, I know how to feed it. Yeah. I do know how to feed a church. Amen. Be very careful of a backseat driver. Yes. Or let me tell you, a backseater theologian. Yes. And they'll get you alone into a living room or a coffee shop or there in a the back corner. And they'll start whispering little things yes. yeah. that nobody else can test. Do you know what you ought to say? Come, let's go talk to Brother Keith. Amen. <laughs> Not because everyone has to pass me. I just know the word of God. I can say, but doesn't it say here? And doesn't it say there? Let's keep it open. Yeah. Oh, always. You know, if anyone ever says, don't tell the pastor. You, alarm bells. Oh, yes. yeah. You ought to get worried. But let me finish here the third. Not only leading the flock and feeding the flock. But protecting the flock. That's why God. Do you know God so loves you? If, if you can honestly say. You have a sincere elder in this pulpit. Uh -huh. A godly bishop. Who really wants to feed you with the word of God. Who isn't scared to challenge you. Or to correct you when you're wrong. But who really loves you and cares for you. Do you know what? That is a sign that God loves you. It's actually from Him. It's because He loves you and cares for you that He gives you shepherds after His own heart. That's why He does it. But this last point, protecting the flock. Look with me at Acts chapter 20, 29. For I know this. What a powerful statement. Do you know I know something, saints? Yeah. You can't be in ministry for years. I've got scars all down my back. I can tell you a lot of stories. There's some things that I know. And there's some things I know from the Holy Ghost. I've got to know them. Paul says, for I know this. Speaking to the elders at Ephesus. Elders. Leaders. The mature ones. The ones who look after everybody else. Paul speaks to them and says, listen to me. He says, after my departing. After I leave you. I'll never see you again. I'm never going to be back in Ephesus. After... I depart, shall grievous wolves enter in among you. Notice that it wasn't until Paul leaves. Notice that as Paul leaves Ephesus and these elders, there is something. Those wolves said, we're not going to try anything in that church until Paul's out of the way. But as soon as Paul isn't there, and he's a, he's a year down the road, no chance to come back. It'll take six months for a letter to get there, not like emails today. Yeah. I tell you, wait till he's well away and we're going to come into that church. But Paul's warning the elders. He said, listen to me, as soon as I leave, always watch out when the preacher's gone. I'm going to be away in March. Yeah. <laughs> and we've watched it over this four years. Right. Every time I'm away, right. I, I tell you, everything comes out of the cupboards and the yeah. closets, crawls out from people's bags, under the seats, yeah. from, from some dark hole at the back. Right. I tell you, everything. Everything comes out the flesh in its glory. Yes. And poor Paul and Soph there managing the meetings, leading them. And they said, man. So we said next time, I'm going to get a camera fixed on the entire room. Yes, and I'm going to be in some other country watching, amen. listening. I'm not really going to do that. But saints, this is what happens. Paul left and he said, but I'm warning you, when I leave, grievous wolves are going to come into your midst. Not sparing the flock. They won't have any mercy on you. They won't care for your soul. They'll destroy you. Notice they're called grievous wolves. That means heavy. Now here's a way to recognize a wolf. Okay. Are you ready? Here is how you recognize a wolf. What is a wolf? It is a man or a woman or a person coming into the church. They don't have a testimony of 10 years of faithfulness in that church. They come into a church. They can come in looking mature. And Paul says they will not spare the flock. But this is how you recognize them. They're grievous. They're heavy. They're heavy. A wolf is heavy. If a wolf jumps on you, he'll flatten you flat as a pancake. What does that mean? It means a wolf is a burden to you. 
A wolf is a problem to you. You're locked in an hour's conversation and you're saying, God help me get me out of this. He's talked for an hour. We're over there in the corner with a cup of tea. He's talked for an hour. I can't get one word in. He's a burden. He's a problem. He then entangles himself in your life. He actually get him, gets himself so involved in your life you can't get free. That is a wolf. That is a burden. That is a problem. And Paul says they're going to come into your midst. But worst of all, he says, see you elders from among yourself. Certain ones are going to start arising. Elders. Mature ones, spiritual. And they seem okay during Paul's time. While Paul is there, they seem fine. But as soon as you remove Paul, they begin moving off track. And you know what they do? They begin drawing people to themselves. Do you know what? You're always allowed to test me. Keith Malcolmson goes off track. Biblically. Doctrinally. In how I treat the sheep. In how I live my own life. and how I treat my wife. There's a church here that ought to say, hold on a second. I am not above question. I am submitted to the word of God. Absolutely submitted to it. Paul is saying to these elders, why is he telling the elders about these problems? They're to protect the flock. There'll be problems coming in. There'll be problems amongst ourselves. But you, he says, you elders need to protect the church from the wolves or from selfish pride. People among yourself rising up. He says, you need to protect them. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15. Listen again to the warning. Beware of false prophets. Which come to you in sheep's clothes. And they come dressed like they're a Christian. They come with the Bible with head knowledge. They come with the right clothes on. And they can pray the building down in the prayer meeting. They look like a Christian. No more than that. They are false prophets. They come looking like they've got the ministry of a prophet. God spoke to me. I know things. I feel things. I see things that you don't see. I, I, I can see what God's doing. I have ministry. I'm called to lead and to preach. That's what I'm actually called to. And Jesus says, beware of them. They are false prophets. Who come in sheep's clothing. But inwardly where you cannot see. Inside. In the heart. In their thoughts. In their attitudes. In the motives of their heart. Yeah. What did he say they were? They're ravening wolves. Do you know the word ravening there? It means again he gets his claws on you. Gets his fingers in you. Makes you feel obliged to him. That you owe him a debt. And Jesus said beware of them. Saints. One of the great tasks of a shepherd is to guard you, to protect you from wolves. Sheep don't fight wolves. Do you hear me? Saints, if a wolf comes into this church, it's not your job to wrestle a wolf to the floor. It's the job of a preacher, a leader, a mature man, the one who's watching over your soul. It is his task to deal with the wolf. Shepherds deal with wolves. Shepherds deal with wolves. Not sheep. I actually care for you. If I see a wolf coming after you, I care for that wolf. Or I care for that little sheep, that little lamb. Do you know what? I would die to protect you. Do you hear me this morning? I would lay. How do you know a real shepherd from a false shepherd? When the wolf comes, false shepherd runs. Yeah. A real shepherd, when a wolf comes, the shepherd goes towards him. The shepherd actually says, I'm going to deal with them. Yeah. Hey, hey, little sheep, just you keep walking. I'll deal with this actual wolf. Jesus said to the disciples, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Who ever saw such a thing? Send them sheep out in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore as wise as serpent, harmless as doves. You need to be wise in this church, every one of you. You need to be harmless. I don't curse wolves. I don't. I just kill them if they need killed. Do you remember that great shepherd? And with this I close. The great shepherd in the Old Testament we all know. He was a little shepherd boy, a young boy. He hadn't even reached 20 very little experience if you looked at him. You know his daddy thought he was immature. And his brother thought he was nothing. And Samuel the prophet thought nothing of him. But you know what that little shepherd boy. When he's out looking after the sheep. And he said you know what when a lamb come. 
I took my sling and I killed him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a bear yeah. come and it was gonna kill a sheep. And I challenged it and I slung my stone and I killed it. And now when a Goliath comes and he's challenging the entire nation, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Someone needs to deal with them. That's a shepherd's heart. Amen. That's what you're actually hearing as a shepherd. Amen. He doesn't care about himself. Hey, little boy, that's Goliath. Saul, all of the army of Israel can't stand against him. He said, oh, man, I'll take him down. I'll eat him for breakfast. Yes. What is that? That's the heart of a shepherd saying, you know what? There's innocent sheep in this nation. Somebody had better do something. Since we are going to raise up in this mm. church of Limerick, in this city, we will, by God's grace, I'll do all I know to do. I'll pray, I'll preach, I'll set an example. But it's the Holy Ghost who actually raises up and sets in the church men who are called elders, presbyters, bishops, mm. preachers of the word. Yeah. And those men, those body of men are going to stand here to guide this church and feed this church and to protect this church and to lead it all into the plans of, and purposes of God until that day when we stand at the throne of God. And those shepherds, those men, when they get to the throne of God, the Lord Jesus Christ says that he'll present them with a crown. Well done for looking after the flock of God. Hallelujah. Well done for feeding the flock of God. Well done for leading them the right direction. Well done for protecting them. Saints, I intend to get my crown. I want you to be my crown of glory. Yeah. That on that day, when Limerick City Church comes, with all of the souls that she saved out of the city, from drunkenness and immorality, and from suicide, and from confusion, and dead religions, and statues, and, and new ageism, and everything else, and when we go marching through the portals of heaven, and and we go marching in as the church of God redeemed, never to sin again, never to fail again, never to be tempted again. And we'll behold the Lamb of God who was slain as a lamb, but he's now triumphant, reigning in power and majesty and glory. Since I'm going home, and by God's grace, I'm going to so sail this ship that if you sail on this ship, I'll get you to the portals of heaven. I'll get you to the throne of God. I'll do everything in my power to exhort you, encourage you, rebuke you, to pray for you, to lift you up. And saints, along the way, please, by God's grace, make my job easy. And when I get down, you come and encourage me. Let's just stand praising. Let's worship the Lamb.